Robert Chesley. Man, are you beautiful. What a great looking crowd. I am absolutely thrilled to have you here tonight. And, you know, this is, I come from rural Wisconsin, which is about as different from LA as you can get. And, but this space, which is, you know, reasonably well painted and, you know, <laughs> with the chairs tightly packed and uh, the wall, everybody along the wall filled in and it's maybe a little bit tighter than it should be. And yet, this is everything I know from growing up because this is like every union hall I ever went to as a kid. Every UAW hall, every steel workers hall, every teachers union hall, and brothers and sisters, I'm gonna tell you that when I was a little kid, I grew up knowing that what we did in solidarity together could change the world, and I know that we will do it once more. I am so glad to be with you. Mike Mann says he wants to move me back six inches. I love it. <laughs> Get a better panoramic view of you. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I promise you I'm not going to introduce everybody row by row, but I do have to say one extra round of thank you to my dear friend and comrade, John Wiener, whose incredible work on radio and the Canadian podcast. <laughs> I am ashamed even be referred to as a historian when I'm in the presence of John Wiener. Because he does rock and roll history. Rock and roll politics history. That is what I aspire to me when, to do when I'm John's age. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, what, 30? Um, I also, uh, Bill, Bill Galeos, in, in back here, Galeos back in the back corner there, who came to and joined us up in Madison and was a fantastic part of our academic community. We, we loaned him back to you in LA, but we got to get him back to Madison. And, and I apologize, because this is ignorance and imperfection on my part, but our sister's sitting next to Bill. Uh, Anita Wilson? Anita Wilson. I apologize. I only met Anita tonight. But I want to tell you, if you ever, and I know there are dark days or imperfect days with KPFK, uh, but I want to tell you something. Even on the most difficult days, if you ever want to know the power and the genius of independent community radio that is dedicated to informing people and to spreading out this dialogue, Anita and I just had the best conversation I've had in you know my adult lifetime and and she's like just i heard this on the radio this i saw heard on the radio this i got and of course she is so much more on the radio but my gosh what a wonderful wonderful radio station this is because of so much information and so much insight it gives to people and i was reminded of that with my time of and i did promise not to go row by row but i would be remiss if I did not, if I did not also point out that the, the greatest capitalist of our time, the greatest, the, the, the most true embodiment of capitalism in our time, right? Miles Drindell, or actor David Clinton, is in the front back row here, one of our great heroes and one of my great comrades, one of my great strugglers for economic and social justice. All right, so now let us begin. I hope that you're just a little bit bummed out by, by Bob's presentation. <laughs> I hope you're just a wee bit scared. Because you know, that's how, it, that's how any good jazz musician does it, right? You kind of, you lay it down, you get people a little bit edgy, a little bit tense. Will this rhythm build into anything? I mean, will we actually get some sort of coherent piece of music here? And it is my job to try and pull it together. And but, but before we do, I want to scare you just a little more. <laughs> can I scare you just a little more? Go for it. All right, let's see what we can do. How many of you folks have heard of Kodak? Okay. I had a brownie. Right, yeah, who didn't have a brownie? Right? So 
Kodak, right? This great, you know, this great American company, epic American company. Everybody knows Kodak, right? Well, Kodak used to have, in 1988, now I know many of you might even remember 1988. <laughs> 1988 was the peak of Kodak's employment. They had about 145,000 people working for them, mostly in the US, but in some places around the world. They did everything you could do with cameras. They did the whole whole thing with the camera. They got the film and they got it developed and they developed the new cameras and they had a wonderful research department. They actually figured out how you could do things with phones. Maybe you could take a picture with a phone. Now I know that's an unimaginable concept. <laughs> but they did all this stuff. And you know what? Most of those people were unionized. They were getting family supporting wages. Kodak was supporting whole cities. It's an incredible thing. Cutting edge of technology, a responsible company, not a perfect company, we know, but one that actually you know, did reasonably right by folks. In 2012, Kodak went bankrupt. <laughs> Gone. It now, there's a little remnant of Kodak now. It's a, a bit, they do a little bit of research and stuff like that, but they're, they're, they're nothing compared to what they were. Now it happened that in that same year, 2012, one of these new tech companies. John, give me your book there. Oh, look at that. Why? Makes a fine holiday gift. <laughs> yeah. Now, one of these new tech companies. And I'm going to just, I can't, I don't know if I can possibly remember its name. Why, what would it be? I think. Well, no, it's, it's, oh, yeah. Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Instagram. You ever hear of that? Yeah. How many here? Who heard of Instagram? <laughs> All right, not as many hands as Kodak. That's interesting. Right. So Instagram, Instagram got sold to Facebook. That's how these big companies make money. They don't make money by coming up with good new ideas. I just want to warn you. If you think there's like all these geniuses sitting around, no, no, those garages got built over about 20 years ago. Now they make their money by buying other companies that have good ideas, and then they, if it's an idea they can integrate into what they do, they do it. If they can't, they just shut it down and get it out of the way because they don't want the competition. So Apple did that. It, yes, woman sit up and go, Apple did that. <laughs> and, <laughs> right, you are. And so Instagram gets bought. And this is the interesting thing. When it gets bought, they had to release, they're bought for about a billion bucks. Nothing, you know, some kids play and that stuff. They had to release the number of jobs they had. Remember Kodak? 145,000 jobs, unionized, supporting whole cities, great research departments, literally building out the technologies of the future. All this stuff, 145,000, remember that number. Now Instagram, one of the companies that really did just push it aside. 13 jobs. Oh. Mm -hmm. like 25. Right, no, she was just an optimist, she said 25. No, 13 jobs, 145,000 down to 13. Welcome to the future. And. They say to yourself, well, what all, how do people do all that photo stuff now? What, who does what those 145,000 people did? It's not like the technology replaces the need to you know, size photos and take them and move them around, all the stuff that they used to do. Who does that? You. We do for free. We do it. We do all that work. And that's cool. We shouldn't resist the technology. But here's the interesting thing. When we do it, do you know what they do? Collect our data and sell it to other people. So effectively, we give the most valuable information about ourselves to someone else for the right to do the work, which used to be done by people who had good union jobs and sustained families and whole communities. Now that should scare you because that's the future that corporate CEOs and people who run think tanks and all the elites of our tech industries, that's the future they understand. And you know, the interesting thing is that there's always somebody who says, but Mr. Nichols, who will buy the iPhone 18? <laughs> well, this is what they understand. And it's a genius thing on their part. They do know, as Bob suggested, eventually they could crush this whole thing, right? That they could take it to such an insane level that there really is not enough people to buy it. But they also, they operate on a quarterly model of life, right? And so to them, 
that next quarter is a lot more important than 25 years from now. And here's what they recognized a while back. It's a fascinating thing. It is that if they take away more and more of our work, if they decontextualize and destructure our work, we will try to fill the void. We will work harder. I know you're not going to believe this. They even think that maybe some of us will start driving our private cars around the street, trolling to try and pick up riders. <laughs> now that, I know it's unimaginable. We'd call it something like Uber, I don't know. They actually think, this is crazy, I know you cannot imagine this, that we might like take our extra room and start renting it out, call it Airbnb. They actually think that we might start to live a gig economy life where we run from little bit of a job to little bit of a job, trying to pull together just enough so that we can survive. And you know what? They're right. We've already done it. Nothing, in, our book opens with the line, you know, welcome to the future that already is. We're not, this is not some distant bells and whistles thing. This is now. We're already filling the void created by jobless future. And we're doing it by working harder, desperately trying to get what we can to survive, but also to buy that iPhone 6. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Because that redistribution of the wealth upwards, that buying into that next technology, that next gadget, is what assures that they keep making money. So now we've got our calculus, right? We understand the dynamic. It is to take meaningful work and then have us work harder, longer hours, so that we can keep buying their products. Henry David Thoreau is right. We don't ride on the railroad. The railroad rides on us. Right? We are the gadgets. We are the tools. The question is, do we free ourselves? Do we step away soon enough so that <coughs> we begin to define that future, not the CEO who wants to sell us something? That's the essential small-d democratic question. It is the essential question for the rest of your lives. No, I, mean, I wish I could tell you we had a better question coming. There's so many wonderful things we can deal with. But do you know what? If we answer this question right, we don't just win a debate. We don't just win you know, a fight with somebody else. We win the future. We actually, we own the future if we win this fight. And we know the stakes if we lose it. But this is the interesting thing about it. There's nothing radical about what we're talking about here. It's a radical concept, but it's not a radical reality. What did Tesla say? Did everybody know who Tesla was? Yeah. Greatest inventor of our time, also the name of a really cool rock band. And But what did Tesla say? He said, he says, I'll invent all these technologies. I'll do it for Mr. Westinghouse. It doesn't matter. They're never going to figure out how to sell electricity. You know, I mean, it's a, you know, at the end of the day, when we invent these technologies, we're going to give them to people and they're going to be freed. The drudgery of people's lives will be, you know, thrown off, and you can actually be able to live this incredibly poetic and rich and decent life. Every one of us will be like a Hollywood movie actor, and and so it's all going to be great, right? That's what Tesla said. Of course, they did figure out how to sell type of electricity and a lot of other things. And then, but what did Einstein say? What did Einstein say? You know, the whole point of all this is to free us, to, to open us up. Even Edison, not the greatest guy, Alexander Graham Bell, they all kept saying, everybody that was coming up with these technologies, <laughs> everybody that was talking about this progress, they all said, well, it's going to be good. It's going to free us. Nobody said, well, the future's going to be awful. The future's going to have us working before dawn till after sleep for less money than we did before in this destructured kind of ill-defined life of gig economies waiting for the point at which it all falls apart. They never said that because they actually knew the power of the technology. The power of the technology is good. There's nothing wrong with this. There may be bad technologies, bombs. There may be good technologies, right? Cures for diseases, things that, that help us to, to see our way through. But the bottom line is it's not the technology. It's what we demand of it. It's what we, the people, say must happen. And so you say to myself, well, Mr. Nichols, that sounds fabulous. So rich and poetic. But how do we make that connection? How do we get ourselves from here to there? Because now we are literally at the here to there moment. 
this is not this is not something is going to happen twenty years from now we are in the definitional moment right now you are blessed to live in this time but you are also cursed to live in this time this is not easy but it is also rich and exciting so they get let me just take it to make you totally clear and how much we are in the moment a year ago if I had said to you that Donald Trump was going to disrupt the entire Republican Party. That Donald Trump was going to figure out how to see off Karl Rove and the Koch brothers and Sheldon Adelson and all this stuff that we rant and rave about by offering something worse than Karl Rove. <laughs> <laughs> right? you know, if I said that to you, you would say, Mr. Nichols, you're just nutty. You know, don't be talking to me about that kind of stuff. Right? I said, you know, Donald Trump's going to have people at his rally swearing to support him, you know, with their hands up. You know, I'd say, that is not going to happen. But then if I said to you, yeah, and you know what else? The guy disrupting the other party is going to be a 74-year-old Democratic Socialist from Vermont. You would say to me, you're nuts. It's not going to happen. The nominees of the two parties are already preordained. It's just going to be it's going to be Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton. That's a given. We you know money and politics. Everything is as it is. Nothing can change. We are on a trajectory that does not ever get disrupted because power is so intense, so overwhelming that we're just going to move on this trajectory. Well, on that case, wasn't. We're in the midst of something amazing right now. Again, we don't often pause. We don't pause long enough to say to ourselves, wow, something incredibly radical is going on around us. It must be more than just a candidate, more than a Trump, more than a Sanders. It must be something bigger that is making this happen. What is making this happen? Well, that 18, 19, 20-year-old kid who goes, and I say, kid, I, I wish. You know, this young adult who goes to a Bernie Sanders rally. Why do they go to that Bernie Sanders rally? Yeah, you know, I, I, I despise our media when it says, oh, they're there because of free college. That is an unimaginable lie. I mean, before he was talking out these ideas of free college, look, they're calling him. <laughs> but before he was talking out these ideas of free college, they were coming. They were coming to these rallies. This is the bottom line to understand. Why were they coming? Why did they come to see the 74-year-old Democratic Socialist from Vermont? They came because they're not stupid. They've grown up marinated in these technologies. They've grown up literally surrounded by these technologies. They see the reality of the future coming at them. And that reality of the future is $200,000 worth of debt to get a degree in a field that is now potentially, even a professional field, to be either extinct or undermined or changed to the point where it is no longer what it was supposed to be. Architecture, the law, nursing. We write about all this in the book, how literally digital and robotification changes will alter these industries radically. And so these, these young people are not fools. They're looking at that, and they come. And you know what? Suddenly they're not terrified by the term socialism. <laughs> <laughs> It's happened before. We've been here before. Not the same, not the same technologies, not the same threats. There are different kinds of threats. We have to understand that. But 200 years ago, we were in the midst of an industrial revolution. And I know that the industrial revolution moved people from one kind of work to another, that this revolution actually moves people out of work. I know the differences between these two, and we can get deeper into that. But let us just imagine and let us recognize the reality of radical change in everything we know built around our work life and our economic life. Has anybody ever been to Great Britain? I don't go that often because I've got no taste for monarchy. But, <laughs> but you know what I like about Great Britain? When you go up in the north of England, those little villages with the thatched roofs. I mean, thatched roofs, that's really cool. Like It's, it's a craft. And they got these nice little little houses, and there's a little church in the middle, and there's like a commons and stuff like that, and there's rolling hills. And you think, well, this is pretty nice. Maybe if I got really rich, maybe I could buy a thatched roof house in a little town in the north of England. That'd be pretty cool. Well, 200 years ago, that's where most people lived. It wasn't perfect. They were not wealthy. 
but they lived in villages. And they were craftspeople in the north of England and Lancashire. They were really, really good at making clothing. And they had so their own little looms and things in their homes. They worked with cloth and wool. They also did other crafts. They made tools. They did all sorts of pretty decent things. It was not a horrible life. It wasn't wealthy. It wasn't elite. It wasn't perfect. They were oppressed in many ways. And yet, they had this life that they knew. Their children were around them. They, their families, they had extended family. A lot of stuff worked. And then somebody came up with an idea. They said, you know, if we took all these people who know how to make clothes really well, and we moved them out of these little villages with their thatched roofs and moved them into nice big slums, right? <laughs> you know, like, like really crowded neighborhoods where you're sort of like forced in, you know, right next to other folks. And then if we let them work from before dawn till after nightfall on a machine next to somebody else on another machine in a great big factory, then they wouldn't make as much money and their lives would not be so great. But I could make a lot of money if I did that, if I set that situation up. And so they did this. Lancashire became the center of machinery in the whole world. Everybody came from the villages, pushed into these factories, into this factory setting. It's where all these industries moved to. And the interesting thing was that they knew at the time how bad it was. William Blake referred to those factories as dark, satanic mills. Mm -hmm. He said that if you went to work in them, you would lose humanity itself. That you would work there, and so would your children, chained to machines. It was such a horrible existence that they decided that they would break the machines. And so they became Luddites. Now I know today we think of Luddite as the most, that's a ridiculous, you don't know how to use your phone, you're a Luddite. But the Luddites weren't fools. They were actually the great craftspeople of their era. They were actually the middle class of their era. And they saw their existence being radically altered. And their initial reaction was destroy the machinery that is altering our lives. Stop the dark satanic mill from operating. And so they had a hero, Captain Swing. With one blow, he could destroy a loom. They also did not have the greatest regard for CEOs. They were not as gentle as we are today. They would go into the mill, arrest the owners of the mills, and try them for crimes against humanity. The British aristocracy was not impressed. We write in the book about this. This is all history given to us by the wonderful woman Dorothy Thompson, the wife of E.P. Thompson, the great historian. People know E.P. Thompson for his history of the English working class. What they don't know is that his wife did better history. E.P. was a wonderful man, but his wife was brilliant. And she studied the story of the Luddites. And, and, and it was left in the files, left in the pamphlets. In the book, we go grab that and pull it back and say, no, there's something here that needs to be understood. And the interesting thing was that in the north of England, at certain times when the Luddites were on the march, the British military had more troops in Lancashire than they did fighting Napoleon in Europe. They feared an organized populace taking on technology, saying, we want these machines to do different things than just oppress us, more than they did a foreign power. But that British military put them down, so they were defeated. And so at night, after they'd worked those long days, they would walk out of the villages on full moon nights. They always did it on a full moon night because there were no street lights. They had to be able to make their way home at the end of the night. On full moon nights, they would go out into the woods, up onto the hills, and they would gather. They had clubs all across the north of England. Luddite, what were Luddite clubs? And what evolved slowly over time, they were so angry. They were so beaten upon, them, so horrified by what had happened to them. And they kept trying to say, well, maybe we could rise again. Maybe there's a military answer to this. Maybe there's a, a structural answer. Maybe, and, and, and it never quite got there. Until finally, in the 1830s, years later, they started to evolve <coughs> into the Chartist movement. And as Chartists, they wrote a people's charter that said that elections had to be fair and open. That everybody had to have the right to vote. Not just men, but ultimately even women. They said that there had to be political parties and that 
Votes had to be counted fairly and equally. They had all sorts of structural, small d democratic changes. You think, well, that's so boring. Why can't we just wreck a machine? And the fact of the matter is what they realized is you can never stop technology. But if you organize democratically, you can get control of the debate about technology. And what came of that Luddite movement? What came of what they did? What came of that Chartist movement that grew from it? Trade unions. What else came from it? The fight for an eight-hour day. The fight to end child labor. The fight to structure workplaces in humane and decent ways, slowly but surely, and never as effectively as need be. They began to radically transform their economic life by having transformed their small d democratic life and bringing themselves to the table so that no longer were decisions made in their name but without their informed consent so that they themselves could make decisions about their future based on the necessity of their lives. Brothers and sisters, what they recognized is that when you are confronted with radical economic change, when you are confronted with dislocation, when you are confronted with a future that seems dystopian, you must rise for economic and social justice, and you must do so with the demand for economic democracy. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, I could go on and on, but this is a very simple equation. We are entering into a period where almost everything that we know will be transformed. I know we're working so hard with this technology here. It's an amazing thing. <laughs> but where so much is going to change, keep your eye on who has the power. Because the fact of the matter is, we don't have to work as hard as we do anymore. We don't have to work as long an hour as we do. We don't have to do any, we don't have to be oppressed by this moment, and we don't have to be gadgets. But we do have to have the power to say that. Our democracy is horrifically underdeveloped. It's a crisis right now. There's no question of that. We must change that. The notion of a political revolution, that's child's play. Of course we have to have a political revolution. Anybody who says, oh no, there can be incremental change that's going to deal with this issue, I'm sorry, run screaming from the room. There's no incremental change that's going to get you out of this thing. There has to be radical democracy. And let me just tell you what our goal is at the end. Our goal at the end is the goal of every great inventor and every great thinker throughout history, that we should live whole and decent and wonderful lives, that we should have time to spend with our children and our grandchildren, that our work should be creative and rewarding, and that we should be surrounded by a social welfare state in which our basic needs are met by the great wealth that we have created, by the great technological progress that we have created. We shouldn't have to debate about single-payer Medicare for all health care. That's a given in a gig economy. If you don't have that, if you don't have organized workplace, how can you possibly get the health care you need? Of course we need single-payer health care. Of course we need, of course we need free transportation. Of course we need free education. Of course we need the basics of a social welfare state because that's what builds around a more humane structure for us. We don't have to work as hard to try and claw our way. But then beyond it, we have to do the hardest thing of all. And that is to change ourselves, to recognize that we don't have to work that hard. That we are not we are not simply our work. We are our families and our communities. We are our creativity and our dreams. This is not romantic stuff. This is human stuff. What we're talking about is retaking humanity and saying that we have a right to live in a future where the benefits of technology come to us not to some billionaire who we will never meet. And so we say, people, get ready. The change that's coming is going to be radical. 
Thank God, God for that. Because what we've got now is inferior. Millions of people work more than 40 hours a week and live in poverty. Millions of people are underemployed. Millions more are unemployed altogether. People struggle to get by. Young people go to college, get all this education, and then end up in debt that does not allow them to use the education that they have gotten. Again and again and again, we see the evidence of a structure that is not working. We have the technologies to break that structure open and to create a rich and humane future. Yes, people get ready. Let us make a future that is ours, not theirs.